Hi. So uh, as Chris said, it's uh, great to be back in a room face to face with just lots of people that we've worked with for so long and some new faces. Um, bear with me. It's definitely uh, two years post doing any of this, a baby moving country in between, so a little bit uh, blow the cobwebs off in the brain. So I'll let the panel do most of the talking today. But really, really pleased to be here today. And I think one of the things that really sums up so much about this conference actually is the fact that the first panel of the day is talking about artists. Fixing artist pain points is the topic. Um, and I think really putting artists front and center of the conversation just really, really sets up just what we're here to do today. And I think starting off this conversation really then can echo into a lot of the other, co you know, the conversations and the topics that are gonna be talked about for the rest of the day. So I think that is so intentional, I think speaks to what Chris and Fast Forward really is about. Um, so just really pleased to have the conversation. So often, uh, so artists are the lifeblood of the music industry and demands on them can be extremely high. What are the shared pain points for artists and how can everyone in the music industry be better for the creators themselves? Um, so I will let our esteemed panel kind of have the first say and introduce themselves and then we'll go through some questions. So uh, who wants to start? Do we uh, start with you, Marcello? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So my name is Marcelo De La Vega. I'm 25 uh, from Australia. I moved here five years ago. Um, I got signed when I was 16 by Atlantic in America. And I kind of got thrown into the machine of it. And I was like, I dropped out of high school for it. And, you know, I had some amazing experiences, met some incredible people, worked with most of the incredible producers that you can, you know, imagine and think of, um, you know, being 16 in a recording studio in, downtown LA with someone who worked on Michael Jackson's like Invincible record was pretty incredible when you're 16 and your friends are still in high school. Um, and yeah, kind of had five years with Atlantic and then I left at my first option. I toured like a crazy amount around Australia um, for five years, which was incredible and an amazing experience. But I think I learned in that time what I wanted and what I didn't want, which is what I'm so grateful for now kind of uh, being independent with uh, distributed by AWOL with an incredible uh, manager. And that's kind of our team. And it's, it's kind of, it's allowed me to like, you know, it's freed my creativity. I work with an incredible producer called uh, Pete Hutchings who did uh, Royal Blood's last record, which has been amazing. We're finishing our record of Real World in Bath. Um, I'm kind of excited to like, you know, excited to, I kind of feel like I'm starting fresh now, if that makes sense. I've, had kind of the last, I want to say nine years to like really become a musician. And uh, yeah, I did the machine, so I know how it works. And um, I loved it, I really did. And I'm really actually grateful for the experiences that I had uh, being signed to Atlantic and Warner under Matt Emsell and Jadam Comfort, who's Unified Records in Australia and uh, Five Seconds of Summer's manager. And it was amazing and I'm super grateful for it. Um, and I learned a lot and I think that's going forward the thing that I want to focus on is like, now that I know what I'm talking about, actually, you know, understanding what is happening in my contracts and, you know, being present on email chains and understanding, you know, where the financials and where your percent, you know, really is going. Um, all that's really important to me. And I think it should be important to all artists. And I feel grateful to be have, have an understanding of the business. And I spend my time actually surrounded by people like Chris, um, who can actually teach me about the business because I spent so many years working on the music. Um, and I think that is something that uh, most artists don't understand is that that's like super, super fucking important. So. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And just to point out as well, we did actually have one other artist joining us on the panel who it wouldn't be a COVID session without someone <laughs> being impacted by COVID. So I'm um, just so pleased that we've got an artist voice on the panel, but, but also imagine there are more as well. Um, great. Callie, let's go over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Callie Bradford. I am Director of Business Development for Syncfault. So shout out Syncfault. This is my fast forward. Um, so I've been here a few times. I'm very excited to now be up here talking to you guys. Um, my background is very much, I was an artist, and then I was in live, and then I was labels for a long time, and now I've crossed over the scary world into music tech, which is very interesting. Um, but it's fun to kind of see that world and how we can use technology to actually help artists and kind of grow their fan bases and be that partner with them as we go. So, yeah, that's me. Thank you. And Harriet. 
Hey, um, I'm Harriet JW. I started a music platform a long time ago called Secret Sessions, which grew into a live event, YouTube channel, and artist development platform. Um, COVID hit, and I started something called Girls to the Front, which is about elevating female and um, non-binary talent in the music industry. And that's kind of morphed into a coaching platform called Creator Business School that helps artists to think more like creators um, and build their brand audience and income. Um, so I come at it from a sometimes slightly loathed position from an artist point of view because I'm all about you know, new, using the new model, going direct to fan, using the tools you have available such as the internet and the dreaded social media platforms. So um, yeah, that's me and really happy to be here. Great, and I think that's so interesting, um, kind of thinking from the artist's perspective and the industry as we all are today, because I think, you know, that duality of the very people that are here to make it easier for an artist to be creative and to have that authentic voice can sometimes potentially make it harder, and there are some great people in the room, and there are maybe some other people that aren't in the room that might not be so great. So I think kind of understanding how you can advise artists or what you would tell your former self, I think is a really interesting thing when we think about artist pain points. But I guess, so kind of going back to the beginning, kind of, you know, Marcello, what do you think has kind of changed sort of the most kind of now in terms of, you know, I, I was thinking about this, like Instagram versus reality, you know, thousands of conferences talking about how great it is for artists, how many artist services are out there, you know, is that your reality? Is that the reality that you're seeing now? And, and what do you think has kind of changed over the last few years? I think, to be honest, I think it's actually, I feel like, so when I started, you know, my label were, you know, pushing me to like post on Tumblr. And uh, there was a period where I, like, you know, Twitter was like the forefront of, you know, kind of social media platforms. So I kind of, I have definitely felt like I've seen it change like from the beginning of social media to like where it is now. And I do have very, like two very different perspectives on it. And I, I, I think it's incredible the fact that we have, you know, TikTok and Instagram and all these, these things to really push our artists forward. Um, because, you know, it was never achievable for a kind of 16 year old in their bedroom to buy, you know, an interface and a couple plugins and make a hit record. Like, I think that's amazing. I mean, it's, you know, when you look back and, you know, back in the day and you know EMI sold the tape to the studios therefore owning the masters like it's pretty incredible that you really can make an incredible video on a VHS camera that our parents have in or grandparents have a super 8 camera in their in their thing and then you can upload that and that is what is cool and that can you know you can do that stuff on such a budget so I do feel like the f how easily we can get our content out there now is amazing and I think that you can look at it from a negative perspective, thinking, you know what, uh, TikTok's killing the industry and labels is only signing TikTokers. And I was sat with a producer called Andrew Watt two days ago and his girlfriend's an incredible musician called Charlotte Lawrence. And she was saying, you know, that's all that labels are signing now. There's TikTok people and that's all they're pushing is where songs are on TikTok. And I think that maybe is, that's the negative side of it, is that we're only doing that and we're not signing artists unless they've got followings already. Uh, and I understand that developing an artist is incredibly expensive and very hit and miss. And you can have an A&R truly believe in someone, but maybe the world doesn't. But I also think, you know, I, al I also think at the end of the day, it's incredible that we have these things. So you can focus on the negatives. And I think that we do need to think about fixing that for our artists and thinking that's not the only people we're signing are TikTok artists. But I also think it's incredible to actually have it. So that's my opinion on that. Yeah, and yeah, Callie, you were nodding away. <laughs> kind of what do you think is, you know, is the industry making it harder, easier? Or we'll kind of, you know, talked a little bit about how you've found kind of building a, an audience and what that I sort of feels like. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because yes, they are signing these TikTokers or Instagram. And, you know, we work with influencers at Syncfold. It's something that's really important for us. But I also think it's weird because people are so focused on those numbers, but are these people actually selling tickets? Are they, are they actually streaming? Are they doing all these things? So it's great that they have these numbers on the social media and that you are able to get you know, your stuff out there, but that's not act, that doesn't actually translate into a career at all times. And I think sometimes also, I love that people are able to make music in their bedrooms and all of those things. I think it, it, it kind of 
um, evens out the playing field, but it also gives a lot of shit out there. And so with such a, you know, audiences that have no kind of attention span at the moment, they're not getting to the good music. They're not getting, because a lot of the greatest music are coming out on the AWOLs or the, you know, the independent uh, labels, but they don't have the budget to kind of splash them out into, into people or pay for ads and it feels really, you know, um, not authentic and all of that stuff. So there are great things about social media and about the Instagram world, but I do think we need to see what, go back to the basics and are they making great music? Are they selling tickets? Are they doing these things? And that's where we need to see where that Instagram versus reality kind of comes from. Definitely agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And Harriet, what do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, just to echo what these guys have said, it's definitely a double-edged sword every conversation. Um, for me, it's really going back to kind of what the key and important metric should be for an artist to measure. You know, I'm often ar asking artists, about their fan base, how many fans do you have? And they immediately list off their amount of Instagram followers or their Spotify numbers when actually a true fan is something very different to those numbers. So I think there's an element of kind of education within the artist community about what you should be putting your time and effort into, what you should be measuring. Do you have a mailing list? Do you have any products that you're selling to these people? You know, what's the actual measure of the potential business that you have? Because you know, an artist that has 2,000 people on a mailing list with 500 of them contributing to a Patreon every month is a lot more valuable than someone sitting there with a million TikTok followers that can't sell a T-shirt. Um, so there's definitely education within the artist community, but I think that issue of kind of warped metrics is the responsibility of everyone that uses social media because, you know, it is that Instagram versus reality, the filters, the you know, only celebrating the good thing, all of that stuff that comes into so many things um, in this day and age. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that it's, it's a double-edged sword. But so just to kind of double click a little bit on that though, so if we think about, you know, post-pandemic, Chris just said, you know, less people are going to pubs, live music, is that actually, you know, really that is the reality of how people are having to connect with audiences transcend borders all of that kind of stuff so thinking you know just thinking about in lieu of live or parking that for one second you know if if we are having to rely on those metrics then you know have you used some good resources Marcello maybe you know you could talk about you know what are some good ways to kind of navigate the kind of the noise with that kind of where you can really cut through understand your metrics yourself or how have you kind of found I guess empowering yourself with the numbers or, or how have you been able to kind of cut through and dilute some of that well, I think I actually kind of doubling back to baseline again, I think the interesting thing about things like TikTok is it's a low commitment follow. So I do think it's like you have these people who have a million followers, but like you're saying, do they sell tickets? Do they stream? It's, you know, you can, a, one video can go viral and then you have a million people thinking you're funny and not actually liking your theme music because that video is aimed towards a different demographic. So I, I do think, you know, when we are talking about the numbers and, and what we're focusing on in, in my team was it's interesting, like, I, so I, I left my label, uh, I left my label like three years ago and in lieu of like, you know, finding new management, every single management company that I approached and spoke to, first question was, how many Instagram followers do you have? And come back when you have, you know, over 20K, 30K and now it's how many TikTok followers you have. Come back when you have a million or 1.5 million and the numbers are going up and it does make it difficult for, for artists. Um, but I think like, in, like now that the live, the whole live thing is kind of, you know, um, taking a hit because of COVID. I mean, ironically having said that, the thing that we are focusing on on my team is uh, we're focusing on building an online audience. But we're doing it by treating music like content. So we're releasing eight singles over the course of 18 months. Uh, we're releasing eight music videos for the singles, eight live versions for the singles, and actually focusing on um, creating creative content. So for me, a uh, big thing that I believe in is like diversifying yourself as an artist. So like for me, I own a fashion label. Fashion is incredibly important to me. I want to be the face of Saint Laurent one day. Uh, but I'll take, Gucci, I'll take Gucci or Prada as well, <laughs> just to fend with you guys. You know. Um, but, uh, and, and also, you know, directing and directing your own music videos and having an understanding about how producing a music, music video works, um, or 
understanding, you know, what kind of film photography you like or photography for yourself, uh, for your press shots, for your artworks. These things for me are really important. And these are the things that I'm focusing on as, as an artist to build my fan base and to be seen as more of a creative uh, and kind of covering all, you know, marks instead of just, um, instead of just being like, you know, what can we do while live isn't, you know, thriving at the moment. And that's in my head what I'm doing. I think that's a great point is being able to diversify yourself is really important nowadays. Um, like, like I said, we work with a lot of cre um, creators and influencers on Pinfold, but we also are kind of trying to get our artists to, to see that there are other avenues on money, where money can come from. So these brand deals, stuff like that. But it has, again, it has to be that authentic thing. And I do think, you know, those numbers are important and obviously building an online presence, especially post COVID world and with the recession coming and our company was built during um, during the pandemic, all of that stuff. So it is really important still to be online. But I think there's also that difference between you know just people liking your page or subscribe and subscribers versus likes and interactions and all of that stuff. So I think it's it's really important to see who's who's interacting with your post, who's who's actually on a mailing list, who's you know if you send out a link and who's responding. I know I saw Sam somewhere. He has a really great platform. Talk to him. Open stage somewhere. He's over there. Um, but yeah, there's all of these kind of platforms that can really help you understand your core audience that actually can be built online and then can transfer over to to when live or yeah, when I'm gonna say when, not it. <laughs> Big difference between a fan and a follower. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that we need to really, really understand. Um, like, I mean, you better to have five thousand follow like fans mm -hmm. who follow you on Instagram and have five thousand people who are coming to your shows spending money. And you know, stream your you're watching your YouTube videos and stuff, and stream your music, opposed to thirty thousand followers. And you know, you know, if you really want to look at Instagram metrics, like you know, people who have I've got a friend who has got twenty five million Instagram followers, and it's only like two percent engagement, and they're real, real people who follow. You know, so yeah. That's what I tell myself about my small following. It's really engaged. My mom likes every post. Um, you are a micro influencer. <laughs> sure. um, so actually, I want to go back to what you said um, in the introduction. Let's move away from social media and talk about. I really loved how you said you were kind of on copy on emails and kind of put yourself at the you know center of of your kind of artist conversations now and with lawyers and contracts. Talk a little bit about how intentional that was or kind of what your journey was to kind of get to that. Because I think again, just you know, a pain point can be really that just sort of, you know, understanding, deciphering kind of legal jargon or just kind of being blinded by what happens, you know, so either if you are, you know, slow and steady and just kind of trying to work your way as, a, as an artist starting out or you hit this real, you know, kind of quick moment and suddenly you're just bombarded with information. How, how was that for you? How, how did you kind of move into just that awareness that you really had to be in control or kind of understand a lot about your kind of journey and contractually how that affected you? I mean, when you're 16 and someone's telling you they're going to own your name in perpetuity, you kind of don't understand what that means. Um, hence, my name was Marcelo, and now it's Marcelo de la Vega. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's just, it's intimidating. You know, it's, it's um, you get into it because you, you know, loved music. You know, you loved the feeling of playing with your friends, some Blink-182 cover when you were, like, a kid. And that's why you get on t into it. And then you realize, you know, there's a lot more to it. So for me, it was just like, I really wanted to just, you know, I really wanted to just not be fucked over. Like, I remember, I, this is one thing that sticks in my head. So I, my old A&R um, booked a trip for a riding trip for me to LA. And uh, I got booked on a tour and we had to cancel the trip, but they forgot to cancel the trip. So they didn't cancel my tickets and it was for my manager. And for some reason, my manager's girlfriend's flights were coming out of my budget. And they forgot to cancel the flights, forgot to cancel the Airbnb. The whole thing cost me 12 grand. And they took that out of my budget. But then we had to rebook the trip for three months later. So the whole thing out of my budget cost $24,000. This is Australian dollars. This is probably around like, you know, I could be totally wrong with 16,000 pounds. That's a lot of fucking money to come out of my, uh, my, you know, my, uh, budget for my album that I was writing. Um, so I, I think uh, when that happened, I really, I was uh, 17 and I realized, that was when I realized, you know, I need to, I need to have a better understanding of where my money is going. Um, 
and not for the purpose of of you know being like killing it but just knowing that like knowing if you know knowing if your manager is expensing something on your behalf uh, you know or knowing you know having like my like my manager now is so open with me with everything he checks me which you know at, like about everything and he just has respect for me and i think a lot of I ha- all, all I heard at The Great Escape was complaining about their artists, about how they didn't wake up, they out of bed, they didn't go to tour and all this stuff. And they were complaining that they wished they had an artist that, you know, did all that. And I was the only artist in the room. And I'm going like, well, I'm, I'm fucking here. Do you know what I mean? And Chris was the one, he's nodding his head, but, you know, Chris, is, uh, Chris saw that and, and has been championing, championing them because of it. So, yeah, just having an understanding. Um, and Harry, you talked about um, since COVID you've set up talking to a lot of young people. You know, what, what's the sort of the advice or, or what are you kind of talking to them about? What are you hearing from them? What are you talking to them about the most in terms of just giving that advice to young people? Yeah, so you, you mentioned in, in the last section about kind of what platforms are there available to, you know, develop these fan bases and get these information. And I think, you know, at the beginning, if you've got a pen and paper, like you don't need a platform and it is all about kind of having these deeper conversations like i always say to the artists i work with depth over scale it's all about getting deep with these people finding out what they want find about, find out what they love you for find out if they want to come to a show or if they want to do a online zoom session and just really kind of getting that deep understanding of your first you know 1 to 5000 fans and i think the whole you know, the digital space and and all the platforms available can really kind of cloud that because, you know, if we can think of these people at the end of the computer screen as individual people that we want to get to know, it becomes a nicer experience for everyone involved um, and hopefully salvages some mental health of people trying to build these these, um, fan bases. Um, You know, on the flip side of that, some of the more painful conversations I have are around full-length music videos like you know most artists I work with I don't recommend to spunk a load of budget into a full-length music video and you know they'll have their head in their hands and like why is nobody watching a full-length music video and I'm like well when did you last watch one you know so it is about the kind of consumption of everybody it's not just these horrible music fans that can't sit through a long piece of content it's how we're all consuming these days which of course isn't our fault it's you know how data exists at the moment but i think we have to kind of jump on these opportunities and look at where budgets are going i spoke to someone yesterday that had spent six thousand pounds on a music video and you know she has less than a thousand people on instagram and that doesn't you know mean to say that instagram is the be all and end all but that is eyeballs that you can then put this in front of so i think yeah kind of being strategic about getting those early followers in and building a relationship with them so that they will consume your content when you put it out is really, really important and not spending too much money on those, you know, very, and I get that, you know, sometimes it is an expression of art and you have to do it and that's a valid reason to spend money. But if you don't have that money early on, like don't put it into these traditional formats because you think you have to do it because you're a musician similar conversation around making an album but that's probably for another section could, could, I, could I ask a question on, on that point um, so I so, so it's a way that I've uh, kind of made money over the last couple of years is actually producing music videos and directing music videos um, and I think the issue with music videos I, so I, I personally am a massive believer in them I have two things that really have stuck with me it's 1975's Robbers music video is what basically convinced me to be a fan and because of that music video I have followed them and been to like 10 of their shows like since then that's what really that's what really and then Harry Styles lights up video those two things for me and that made me love Kodak film which is now what I you know so it's like you know I do think they have a they have a they have a place but they're incredibly expensive to make I think the issue with them is locations minimum going to get good locations going to be a grand to two grand director's fee Editor's fee, color grading is the most ridiculously expensive thing ever. I feel like you, I mean, I, I know this, I just, I made a video for one of Rupert Murdoch's grandkids, and it was six grand, and it should have been like 60,000, but I pulled every favor that, I literally pulled, I pulled every favor that I could. 
and I do, I really think you can't make them, like videos are so hard to make cheap unless you do them basically by yourself. Um, so I, I, want, I really wonder what the solution is there. Because um, I do think that if we want to look at Chris's metrics with YouTube and people discovering people on YouTube, surely there has to be something in that data. I kind of disagree. Um, I do think that you know, if you want those shiny, pretty ones that Harry Styles are making, it's gonna cost a lot of money. Oh, of course, and of and I do think it depends on the artist because some of my favorite music videos I've ever made in my career have been on a shoestring budget because you kind of have to, you know, you have to kind of do that creatively and all of those things. And maybe maybe other people don't like them as much as I do, but um, I think they, they came out because they really showed who the artist is. And I do think that's where it comes down to if you should do a music video or not. Because if your fans are going to watch it, obviously. And if, it, if you are Harry Styles, obviously everyone's going to watch it. Um, but uh, there are some people that you know, can tell a story and are so engaging in these music videos, then obviously do it. There are other ones, like you said, that it doesn't make sense to do them because you're just following that old school record label. We, we put out a single, we put out a video, we do rec you know, all of those things going forward. Um, but I do think you can make them to represent yourself on a smaller budget, they, they might not be as shiny, but they're not coming on, you know, they're not going on TV anymore, so that's a little bit. I mean, it does go to my point with saying you can make a VHS thing. Yeah, yeah, that it. is true. But so I'm, I'm not saying it's like the only thing, but I also don't think it's like a, we should rule it out completely. Yeah, but and it's I think- also like understanding how to make them cheaper. Yeah, yeah that's more, and I think you as point. a producer would probably know how to do that well, but I think just somebody with a, you know, their grandma's VHS, who doesn't have that creative ability, that it, you know, it, I've sat through a lot of like, what do you think of my videos? And it's like, oh, and that, you know, that comes with that creative. It's a bit like when the girls go to a festival and they try and look like they've already been to the festival by backcombing their hair. It's like, you need to have the process of making a big budget music yeah. video to, to be able to strip, to be able to strip that back. So, so one thing, that I'm encouraging a lot of artists I'm working with to do at the moment, which they hate when we first start talking about it, but end up actually really enjoying the process, is instead of making a full length music video, create 20 pieces of short form content using exactly the same hook of your song that you think is the best or the most catchy part, and just put it out over and over again so it, you know, it has that earworm, people really start to look at it and then look at the data of that versus your music video. So I've said to them, like, we'll create music videos in the future if that's what you want, but can we just do this test? And the data of creating those kind of 20 bits of short form video with that one part and using that as an advert to direct people to Spotify or direct people to a bigger length music video if you want has seen really, really good results in terms of um, putting that time and effort into, into that. Yeah, it's like vested interest obviously from Devo, the home of the music video. Um, but I think it's about, as you say, it's, um, it's about both, right? I think it's about scale. It's about doing it at the right time. It's about doing it with the right budget. And I think, you know, that's really important and having an understanding, you know, there are so many people that are watching music videos for every different type of thing. You know, we're seeing huge surges in catalog because actually now we are on TV. So actually music videos being watched on TV opens up a whole new level of discovery and consumption. But I think the overarching point is, is the same for anyone that's working at more of a, you know, DSP or on the tech side of the industry that actually that serves one side of the industry and actually I think you know so much of what we're talking about today is about you know having that understanding that information to just be able to make whatever decision you need to make and to kind of empower artists and for artists to be at the center of the conversation because they are <laughs> and I think that's what's really important right it's about not getting ripped off no matter who you're talking to it's about understanding the metrics no matter who you're talking to and to be able to as we always talked about you know to cut through that noise um so I think just to kind of you know think about you know what what sort of one of the sort of big things that you wish you knew I always like that question on a panel what's one of the things you wish you could have told your younger self go to like honestly if you want to do a music video go to film school with students like I, this is something that I think about. I, I this is something I tell people a lot. Um, if they can't afford that, is go to film school students because they're looking at, at doing work and and they're the ones who are in school knowing how to rig up lights. They know how to use Premiere Pro and you know DaVinci Resolve for color grading and stuff. Like because they're learning. Yeah, they're not going to be amazed. They won't be the best videos ever, but they also fucking could be. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I I really yeah. I mean, 
children are our future. Callie, yeah, what do you, I mean, yeah, so you, we haven't really talked about your sort of artist journey before. Anything to kind of share on that side? Oh, I gave up the artist journey way <laughs> long ago. <laughs> I'm just a karaoke singer nowadays. Um, Go on. I, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. What's your karaoke song? Oh, Hit Me With Your Best Shot, Pat Benatar. Absolutely <laughs> fabulous. I mean, smashed it. <laughs> wow, I've told a whole group of, now everyone's going to be um, waiting to hear it. There used to be Fast Forward where we did karaoke at the end, and that was really fun got very scary at the end of that, I'm not gonna lie. Um, sorry, what was the question? Uh, for my artist self or just in Or general? advice, yeah, just just wish, you know, art, art, advice to artists, advice to your younger self, what you knew, what you wish you knew. Um, I think my younger self was so, so focused on, I can only work in one sector, of, I mean, one side of the music industry, and there's so much out there. Like, my journey has been so crazy from artist to record, I mean, to live, to record label, now to music tech. I think saying yes to other opportunities, and that's for artists as well. Maybe, you know, you have a writing session and you've never wanted to really just be a, to have, be a writer or something. So just say yes to things, I guess, could be my tip. Yeah, Harriet. Um, I think it's about kind of building things. So there's this saying that is, you, you often overestimate what you can do in a day, but underestimate what you can do in a year. And I think the kind of slow building of things is, is really, really important. And instead of always going for those kind of huge metrics, um, you know, if you were to have three in-depth conversations and get three people's email addresses a day, by the end of the year, you might have a thousand people that really love and care about what you're doing. So looking at that long game. Um, but also I think I learned early on, build it and they won't come. And I think that applies to music videos, to songs, to tech platforms. You know, I got 40 grand investment for a website, spent it, no one came to look at it. And that was my learning early on that you need to do things in a lean way and really test things. Um, and that applies to, you know, the artist, uh, song making, music video making, all of that as much as it does the, the tech world as well. And what do you think artists can really do to empower themselves? We talked about it a little bit, but what just I think just yeah, really own that own that data in a in a in a lean way again, like spreadsheet, pens and papers, write people's names down. You know, if you're playing a gig, make sure someone's going around with that um with that pen and paper and really think about these points of connection where you can really try to build these you know, I say it all the time, but these 1,000 fans and, and whether, you know, whether you think a lot of the essay or not, there's definitely something to be taken about doing it slowly, getting the data and owning it, and then going to big business. I think people are way too early to say, I need a manager, I need a label, I need a PR company, I need a publishing deal. You don't need any of that before you've built that kind of real core fan base, which you can do in a year. Completely. I say educate yourself like come to these kind of conferences, read Music Business Worldwide, really understand what's going on and the different trends in the industry. And like you said, um, learn about contracts, make sure you know what's going on in your own career and what's around you. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I was just what, kind of what I said at the beginning is just completely agree with you. I, I, could, I would both um, educate yourself because it's really gonna be your kind of like, I don't wanna say weapon, but it's really gonna be what's gonna help you really, you know, propel yourself forward. Great. I don't know if someone's going to wave to me to tell me to do questions, but I'm going to use my initiative and do some questions. Um, does anyone have any questions? we we'll start. And do we need a mic? No, you can shout. Shout? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got a mic. There we go. It's coming to you. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> oh. Testing this works? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, one over here. <laughs> thank you you should say your name hey guys I'm Liv thank you so much for that talk that was really good um, I feel like one of the biggest artist pain points is funding um, obviously all these things are great having music videos putting loads of money into marketing trying to grow your fan base but as an emerging artist I feel like one of the biggest struggles is funding to put into all of those things don't you have if you have any advice for emerging artists of how to seek funding? I know obviously there's people out there like PRS and other things, but I, I know they're getting cut at the moment and it's it's just really hard to fund. So any thoughts Great on that? Point. Are you an artist? 
I am, yes. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, actually, Chris sent me this incredible uh, company yesterday, so you should definitely speak to Chris after this about that because he he has a lot of answers about that. But yeah, it's incredibly difficult. But uh, in Australia, I know these companies like APRA that give grants. Um, they also have studios available at Rack and stuff like that. So y if you, you can look at like, you know, that cuts out 600 pounds of the budget if you need to record it, if you need to use a studio, do you know what I mean? So things like that. I, I definitely, I'm not 100% sure, but I think there are there are a lot of companies like AWOL uh, offer grants, believe, like distribution is that way. They offer some grants. Um, but I also think Gov, I think Gov offers some grants. I could, I could, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, the Arts Council, um, Help Musicians UK, we should have done some stuff. They, they helped during um, COVID. Um, there's obviously the wonderful Beat Bread, who's one of our great um, uh, sponsors today uh, for the advances. So there's lots of things there. Um, yeah, you just got to kind of dig into things. It's a lot easier when you're not in London to get those things um, because L London is oversubscribed. So if you kind of have anyone you know that you can register your address outside of London, the Arts Council gives a lot more money. Um, so does the Department of International Trade, all those kind of things. London is just London. So. The problem with BBC introducing for London yeah. is it's oversaturated massively. Absolutely. So definitely yeah. don't apply for BBC <laughs> introducing in London. Try do it in Surrey or Kent or something. Yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, do you want to stand up? Whatever you like. Cool. Um, so I am a, I would, I'm a, I'm a musician and an artist, but I would say that my introduction to the music business has been as a filmmaker. So I'm really a frustrated filmmaker that started making music. And some of the frustrations that I had as a filmmaker was that um, the difference between filmmaking in the music industry to filmmaking in the filmmaking industry is that, um, I guess, um, things like, um, above the line and below the line and things like if you're a director and you made a music video for example you're not going to get any of the streams or the royalties that you would perhaps if you was a filmmaker who was making a film and that might get them synced on airplanes etc cetera, etc cetera. so i guess vivo for example um what are some of the things that you guys are doing taking consideration things like yourself marcella where artists are also not just musicians but they're also part of the creative team and some of the splits aren't necessarily as transparent or fair as they would be on the other side of the line as filmmakers. Yeah. Um, so we are primarily, well, we, we are entirely kind of label focused. So exactly to your point, the kind of structure that we have means that everything is paid via the label. And then so, but, but that isn't just the major label. So we work with hundreds of distributors kind of right across the world and actually have just done a deal with the DistroVid kind of network, which, which is really great for kind of the independent sector to kind of pick up a lot of the work that we do with AIM and A2IM, but doesn't answer the question around like the film creativity. I think, you know, we celebrate, you know, the creativity of, of, of those that have kind of made the video, but it is very difficult because that isn't the kind of mechanic that, that we were set up to do. But I think what we are trying to do via, you know, the social media and the platform that we have is to be able to kind of educate. So we've been, you know, developing formats where we'll shine a light on the team behind. So we're able to kind of use our platform and kind of help market and things like that. So absolutely kind of fundamentally, essentially not part of, of, of the kind of Vivo core business, but I think our kind of mission really is to be at the center of, of the artist and the creative story. So I think for us, you know, and, and, and remember, you know, we really are at the sort of, and in a lot of ways, the sort of, the you know, the, the, the Harry Styles and those kind of big videos too, that that's kind of where we have our kind of MO. But I think for us, where we're able to kind of help. So for example, I have to leave this event to go to an event that we do at our studio in London in Hackney, where we work with young people right across the industry. So we work as like a mentorship scheme. So we'll work with film directors, creators, producers. Um, so really kind of able to kind of use our platform to kind of nurture that side of the talent, um, but just always interested in kind of how we can kind of, as I say, talk about the behind the scenes, but, but primarily that will always be through our kind of social activations and some of the marketing that we do. I think you could also have those conversations with any of the artists or labels that you're working with kind of like a producer that asks for points on the album. You could have that conversation. It's not normal yet, yep. but 
but that could be something that's a great way to start those conversations and maybe that could move into the new norm. We're at such a turning point in the industry right now that why not shake some stuff up and see what happens. And I think, sorry, and also just to jump in as well, I do think that the, the conversation about who is involved in a record via production or who is involved on the production side of the video, I think, as you say, now is the moment. People are really, you know, as we said, this isn't going to be an, an emerging artist spending however much on a budget, but actually the beauty of a cinematic video, I think there actually is a real appetite at the moment to sort of talk about what that journey has, lo you know, looks like and feels like. And so, uh, as, as you say, kind of talking to your team and talking to who you're working with to become a team and to kind of present it as that, I think that's really important, especially when there's so many different avenues now for the light to be shone in terms of, you know, through awards, through recognition, through, um, you know, the, the appropriate credits that need to be there. You know, my, my father's a record producer. I've had this my entire life in terms of the artist and the other. So I think it's about making sure that you are not forgotten and that you're mm. integral to that creative process and those you work with understand that. I mean, I don't know if this, I don't know if this helps at all, but it just came to mind because it's like a way of maybe thinking differently, thinking outside the box. I cannot remember their names, but my uh, a director that I work with all the, guy, all the time, this guy called Duncan Smith, he was telling me about these two guys who made, like they were like, we'll make music videos for rappers for free if their name could come up before anything started. So it was like, they made like 100 music videos for like 100 rappers, and it was like their name, then the rapper's name, and the song. And now, they've because they were like, such in high demand directors because everyone wanted to work with them because they just made just bulk videos for everybody. They now own like a, a company that sell um, that sell color grading like uh, bases and they sell film grain bases and stuff like that. And now the company is worth like millions and millions and millions of dollars. So that was from they got investment from being those two guys from the directors who just do everything and are seen everywhere. And I, I'll get the name for you after. And I'll send him a message. You can yeah, find me amazing. too, and we can talk too. But I think it's about you know becoming your brand. You know, as you say, there are directors, producers, are artists in themselves in terms of a certain artist who wants to work with an, a, a director or a film producer or a music video producer that can make that look and feel down to lighting. We literally will work with people because we love the lighting design they did for one video. And so you become a brand in yourself as well. So I think it's about finding that and building yourself to be that too. So thank you to the lovely thank panel you. kicking us off this morning. Thank you thank so you much. Thank um, you. And thank you to our lovely audience. Um, thanks, Chris. Thank you.